Yes, we'll read from Matthew 9, from verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the, his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Thank you. In a, a very, very well-known story called Les, Mir Me Les Miserables, sorry for if you're French speaking, I'm messing it up. Les Miserables, uh, the um, main character, Jean Valjean, uh, gets out of prison after 19 years. He's sentenced for stealing a bread. And then all like rugged and dirty and like messed up from years of mistreatment, he finds his way to the house of the bishop and the bishop opens his house to him, even though the servants object, and he serves him a meal, and he sits down with him, he talks with him, and John immediately says, you're not like the others. You're not like the others. And the bishop even offers him a place to stay for the night before he has to travel on. But in the middle of the night, John wakes up from a nightmare. After all these years of mistreatment, he you know, he's, he's, he's hurt, he's damaged, and he wakes up from a nightmare and decides to go downstairs to get back into the kitchen where they were dining and to steal the silverware from the bishop because this is the only way he now knows how to live. The bishop finds out, tries to confront him, but he knocks him to the floor and makes a run for it. Well, the next day... Um, the police catches him with his bag of silverware and they bring him back like under arrest to the bishop. And they come to the bishop and they say, well, here's your silverware back. And the bishop walks up to Jean, still with a black eye, and says, I'm very angry with you. You left early and you forgot the most, the most valuable silver that I had that I offered you, the candlesticks. And so he gives them the candlesticks and the police is all like, What's happening here? Like, did you, did you give all that to him? Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And he looks at John. And when the police has left, he said, never forget, I bought you with a high price. In this way, the bishop uh, saves him from an even worse treatment, an even worse uh, sentence, probably death, and shows him, even more importantly, the gracious character of God. And this is something that will turn Jean's life around. When you reflect on the four Gospels, what would you say is the main method for mission of Jesus? What is the main method of his mission? In the Gospels, we find Jesus three times saying, the Son of Man came to. Quite an important statement. He is the Son of Man. It's a a lot of heritage in the Old Testament, what that means. And it's a statement about, you know, what he came to do. Just a little test. Do you, do you know any of the three statements? The Son of Man came to. Just anyone. Go out. To serve. To serve and not to be served. And to give his life as a ransom for many. There's another one. There's another two. Anyone? No. We have a lot of work to do here. <laughs> the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Yeah, rings a bell. There's a third one. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. <laughs> the first two are statements about what he came to do. He had a mission, and his mission was to seek and to save the lost. He came to, he came to serve and not to be served. And he, he came to give his life as a ransom for many. The third statement is about how. How did he come to do this? Eating and drinking. It's actually a response to, uh, to um, what the Pharisees say to his disciples. They come to his disciple and they say, like, 
Why is your rabbi behaving like a glutton and like a drunk? He is eating too much. He is drinking too much. And Jesus responds and says, well, like, here was John the Baptist. He ate like uh, locusts and wild honey, and you said he had a demon. Now here's the son of man. He came eating and drinking, and you think even worse of him. So, you know, what is the truth? Or what do we need to do? Jesus ate and drank so well that he was called a glutton and a drunk. The main mission strategy of Jesus, his method, was one of hospitality, much like the bishop showed Jean Valjean. We see this hospitality strategy play out so beautifully in the story that we just read. Jesus meets Matthew, the tax collector, who then becomes Matthew, the disciple, and who would later become Matthew, the gospel writer. He met Matthew with hospitality in such a way that his life was turned around. And I'm going to give you some backdrop, some context to this whole story that will help you to understand this even at a deeper level. First of all, we need to understand a little bit more about tax collectors. Now, if you've been around church long enough, you've heard this explanation about 10 to 20 times. I'm sorry if you're quite new, this may be really helpful. Tax collectors, we're not like tax collectors today who sit behind the computer and just send you you know, the information about how much you need to pay or you know, if, you, if you're generous to a church, then usually how much you get back, which is a lot more fun. Um, they, w- they weren't like that. Tax collectors worked for the oppressive government of the Romans. The Romans uh, ruled you know, much of the then known world in, with strong military force and with heavy taxation, making sure that um, people would you know, stay where they are. There wouldn't be uprisings. And so this taxation, they didn't do themselves, but they um, got people to do it for them. So Matthew was a Jew from the Jews who worked for the oppressors to collect these heavy taxes. And what most of the tax collectors then did was uh, they became corrupt and decided to um, require even higher taxation than was actually needed. It's just their own little bonus. So they were some of the most hated, if not the most hated people in the land. They worked for the enemy. And this left tax collectors completely outside of the Jewish community and left them with no options but to find friendships among other outcasts of Jewish society, hence the phrase tax collectors and sinners. This is the only company that they could find where they could share their wealth with and party with. Tax collectors and sinners, the outcasts of society, the only people who could, they could turn to for a social circle to, to feel like they belong because the rest of society spit them out. Something there of what isolation and exclusion does to the human heart, isn't it? But then another important context for what is happening here is the way that the Jewish world viewed the home and viewed the table. The Roman occupation of the Holy Land really bugged the people, especially the Pharisees. You know, here in the Old Testament, there was this promise of a, of a, of a new world that would come, of, of a new people. Right? The book of Isaiah, if you read from two times already today, is, is, is full of it. And they expected after the exile in Babylon and then a a subsequent repentance and and a different way of living, they expected that God would come and and liberate them from foreign oppression. And so the Pharisees were convinced that if they could get the Jewish people to fully commit to a holy life in line with the Mosaic covenant and with the law, this would usher in a sort of military messiah that would conquer the Roman Empire and re-establish the kingdom of Israel like in the time of David and Solomon. And so every bit of literature that you'd find on the Pharisees from from back then would mention their zeal, their dedication to this purpose. Essentially, this wasn't even a political movement. It really was a spiritual renewal movement seeking to draw people back to study and practice the Torah. Contrary to what you might think, Actually, the group of the Pharisees, which was quite large, um, 
is the closest group in Jewish society to Jesus in terms of theology, even though he was, you know, word fighting <laughs> with them quite often. In their zeal for personal holiness and for renewal, they took the instructions from the Old Testament for the priests and for the temple, and they applied them to the home. They said if every man can become a priest and every home can become a temple, then surely we can usher in the kingdom of God. In their vision, the home and the table were sacred spaces that should not be defiled. And so they uh, applied all the strict rules about, um, you know, so they had all these cleaning rituals before meals, you know, not just washing your hand, but like ritually washing your hands and cleaning the cups from the inside and the outside and this and that, all these rituals so that things would not become defiled. And especially, so they already had all these food laws about what not to eat, but then they added on that who you could or could not eat with, all to kind of block out the bad, to make sure that the home and that the table would not get defiled. So do you see how the Pharisees might have a little problem with a rabbi that reclines at the table with sinners and with tax collectors? The main strategy to purify the nation was to keep the home and the table pure, so that God would send his Messiah in a revolt against the Romans. But here's this rabbi claiming to be the Messiah, and he sits down for a meal with the very enemy and his promiscuous friends. Jesus replies to their objections. Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And so where the Pharisees kept their distance from anything and from anyone that might be unclean because their presence would defile them, Jesus actually does the opposite. And he finds the sinners and he eats with them because he knew that his presence, like their presence would not defile him. He knew that his presence would sanctify them. And so where the table for the Pharisees was a place that, was mar that marked their holiness through exclusion, for Jesus, the table became a place where he expressed his holiness through inclusion, through welcoming. Everyone was welcome at his table, and at his table others could taste of the goodness of God. In the way that Jesus ate, he would enact grace. He would show people what grace is. Just through the simple act of sitting down for a meal with those considered sinners based on the law and excluded by the zealous religious system, Jesus offered them grace. Even before he said anything, he was showing them the grace of God. And so for the first time in a really, really long time, Matt gets to experience the love and the acceptance because someone outside of his circle of tax collectors and sinners was willing to break bread with him and to dip in the same bowl. A radical act of grace opened his heart to the words of the rabbi and would change his life forever. Over the last couple of months, we've explored uh, eight and now nine practices from the life of Jesus. Practices that will help us to be with Jesus, become more like Jesus, and do the things that Jesus did. And so we've explored uh, Sabbath and prayer and fasting, scripture, solitude, simplicity, over the last two weeks, generosity, community. And today we end with hospitality. And we journeyed through these practices, um, and most of the ones in the beginning were, had to do with your, your personal spiritual life, like how do you pray and fast and read scripture and all of these things, really, really beautiful, really, really helpful to build up a strong personal relationship with God. But at some point, and that's the most of the last practices, this has to flow over into the way that you live your life connected to others. And that's why generosity and community and today hospitality are so important. There's 
a movement from the inside to the outside. If you think of the word mission or if you think of the word evangelism, what comes to mind for you? I think for most of us, somewhere, even if we have a bigger grasp of the word evangelism, we'll think about someone in the city stand there, like on a box, <laughs> evangelizing people, or, or just meeting with people and, and, and talking to them about Jesus. I think this is really beautiful. I remember uh, with two classmates for when I was in seminary, um, we would walk somewhere in the city, and we were on our way to a McDonald's to uh, eat, and then we lost one of them on the way. And uh, uh, a friend who knew him a little bit better, he says, ah, like, we'll just, we'll just go there. We'll just sit. He'll find us. He's probably just talking to someone about Jesus. <laughs> like, I was just getting to know him. I was like, what? <laughs> like, like oh, he's, he's just talking to someone about Jesus probably. He'll be fine. He'll, uh, he'll find us. I think this is beautiful. I think this is so, so cool and so great. And you see the apostles doing this in the New Testament as well. They, they travel from city to city and they talk to anyone that wants to hear about Jesus. A problem with this, though, is that for so many of us, this is not something that would come natural at all. And I must admit, I'm one of them. I love talking about Jesus. I, I like it a lot more from up here than somewhere on the street, one-on-one -on -one with someone that I don't know, unasked for. For most of us, it feels really like a stretch. The very idea of evangelism makes many of us uncomfortable, even resistant. We think that it's not for us because we're not wired in that way. In the life of Jesus, we see that sitting down with people for a meal, this hospitality was actually his main method for mission. And so in his method for mission, we can also find a way to share the gospel with others in a way that's accessible to all of us because most of us will eat seven days a week, three meals a day that gives us 21 opportunities a week to share a meal with someone else. And apparently the gospel pairs really nice with a glass of red wine. Tim Chester says this in a book called A Meal with Jesus. And I must admit that a lot of the content for today are based on this book. Um, he says this, Jesus didn't run projects. He didn't establish ministries or create programs or put on events. He ate meals. If you routinely share meals and you have a passion for Jesus, then you'll be doing mission. It's not that meals save people. People are saved through the gospel message. But meals will create natural opportunities to share that message in a context that resonates powerfully with what you're saying. Both in the Old and New Testament, you find that hospitality is very highly valued. In the Old Testament, uh, the laws of the Old Testament include a bunch of laws that have to do with treating the stranger well. And as I um, explained in a previous message on hospitality, that the Greek word is actually loving the stranger. It's a, it's a compound word of, of love and stranger. So it's, it's, it's about loving the stranger. It's about loving someone that you don't know, but kind of offer, yeah, offering hospitality. Hey, welcome in. And so in the Old Testament, there were a bunch of laws that had to do with this. So like you have to, you can't, like when you harvest, don't harvest everything but by the side of the road, don't harvest that bit so that strangers, like travelers and, you know, the poor can, can harvest a bit for themselves and also eat. It's very uncommon in this time. Actually, as a foreigner, like in, in a foreign land, you, you'd be very vulnerable. Uh, you'd be open to attack from anyone. But the Israelites, well, we're supposed to be different. And in the New Testament, hospitality becomes an instruction for, for everyone from the, from the church leader to uh, the poor widow, it's an instruction to everyone, be hospitable. In both of Paul's lists with characteristics of church leaders, in 1 Timothy 3 and in 1 Titus 1, hospitality is mentioned. They need to be hospitable. It's a characteristic of the early church. 
this well-known passage in, in Acts 2 that comes straight after the, the report of, of the revival on the, on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people became believers. They formed this huge church community. What did they do? Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. For the early Christians, hospitality was a mission method that everyone got to participate in. They showed hospitality to strangers. They showed hospitality to travelers, to the poor, and to the sick. Their hospitality to the sick over time became more and more organized, which explains why we call a hospital a hospital and why it's connected to hospitality. It's just organized hospitality for the stranger who is in need. The reason why hospitality is such a powerful missional act is the proximity to the other. You sit down together. You eat the same bread. You drink from the same bottle. There's an equality in there. And in much of what we do in mission, there is an inequality. The very act, And this is not wrong necessarily. It's just something to be aware of. When you are missional towards someone who is in need, like uh, someone on the street and you give him a bowl of soup, you're the giver, he is the receiver, and you have something that the other person needs. If you, when, you, when you evangelize, when you share the gospel with someone else, you're really giving a message that I've got something that you need. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. This is how we receive grace. God has grace and we really need it. So, you know, there you go. But there's, there's an inequality there that doesn't always work. And when you share a meal with someone, there's an equality. And that's what makes Jesus act towards Matthew and his sinner friends so powerful. He sits down with them at the same table. He eats from the same bread. He drinks from the same bottle. There's an equality there. And that's why this is so powerful. And as they talk, and as they listen, and as they chew, and as they swallow, slowly Matthew's heart begins to open to the message of this strange rabbi from Nazareth who is willing to enter into his world because he really cares. If I'm really honest, I think the vision of the Pharisees is actually a really beautiful one. Don't you think? They believed like if we can focus on purification, on becoming clean, on, on experiencing personal revivals, on, on wholeheartedly, completely dedicated living for God. And if we all do that, then surely God is going to show up and going to liberate us and change these things around. Honestly, much of this is the vision behind this message series and about the journey that we're on to talk about practices, the practices from the way of Jesus. And if we all get to, get to live them, like with full commitment, there's something's going to happen. You know, God is going to show up. This is going to lead to revival and renewal, at least here in our church and in our country. And you know, if Christians would only just, you know, live wholeheartedly for God, then, you know, then will come the next step. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful vision. But there's something that the Pharisees got very wrong in their vision for renewal. And that is that holiness for them was the result of separating themselves, of keeping everything that would defile, that is not part of their laws, that is, that is outside of their realm of grace. To keep it out, keep it at a distance so that they might not be defiled. Their holiness was one of fear more than faith, of exclusion and not inclusion. But the holiness of Jesus was expressed through the inclusion of the outcasts, sharing a meal, even with a traitor. And the funny thing is that the church would actually end up living out the vision of the Pharisees, that every believer would be a priest, that every home would be a temple, but they did it in the way of Jesus. And so they opened their homes to the stranger and the neighbor, by the way. 
They opened their house to the rich and to the poor, to the outcasts, to the celebrities for a shared meal, giving them opportunities to share God's story and so ushering in the kingdom one meal at a time. I'm going to be really honest again. If I look at myself and what's happening on the inside in the times that we live in over the last in decade or the last two decades, I feel a tendency towards holiness through exclusion rather than inclusion myself. I mean, we live in such an well, also interesting but also difficult time when so much of the world is changing and is in and our our Western world or our our, our city or our, our nation or the one that you happen happen <laughs> to live in is really just going in a different direction, not towards the kingdom. It's really almost running in a diff, uh, in the other direction. And in my heart, I'm thinking, if I can just, you know, keep myself safe, if I can just keep my family safe from all of this, then we'll be all right. And if we can all do that, then we'll be all right. If we can just, you know, keep on blocking out the bad and embracing the good, then God will show up and he'll do the rest. The big problem is that this is not the way of Jesus. He called us to live a holiness that is proactive, a holiness that is outgoing, that is inclusive, that is welcoming, that is risky. Proximity through hospitality is the mission method of Jesus, and therefore it should be the mission method of everyone that follows him. So to conclude... We finally arrived at the end of this message and at the end of a 10-part series. Well done, all you guys. How can we live out this beautiful practice of hospitality from the way of Jesus in our everyday lives? As I've said through this series, every message we're just tasting briefly of a practice that we're going to dive in more deeply over the next two years. So it's a whole journey. Stick around. You know, do an extra master <laughs> or like slow down in your bachelor or ask, ask for another year as an exp expat to be part of this, you know. Um, we're going to start in, in February with four weeks on the practice of Sabbath. Uh, and so I like, kind of go through all nine of them just over the next uh, two years. Um, so we're going to dive into this one also more deeply in two years' time or so. Um, but you can already start now. And it's, it's good to discuss this with your group or with your triad, whoever you're meeting this week. And to already think about how can we, how can we build a culture of hospitality, where we, where we live out this hospitality as a church, but also as individuals, as, as homes. So my challenge for you is in the coming month, so there's a little bit, a little bit more time in the week, in the coming month, maybe around Christmas, Find someone, uh, find an opportunity to share a meal with someone who is not in our church. Preferably do this in your home and see if there would be an opportunity to share something of the gospel. But maybe it's just friendship building first. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team up. And we're going to pray. And before I do that, I'm going to invite you to meet with someone from our uh, ministry team, we love praying for people. Uh, it doesn't have to be a response to this message. It can be about anything that you're going through, that you're living through, that you need encouragement in, that you need wisdom or word from God in. Our ministry team will be ready here on the on the sides. We just love to pray God's blessing over you. Uh, so if you need that today, come and receive prayer. Let's stand up and let me uh, let me pray, and then we head into worship. Jesus, you continue to amaze us and surprise us. Just the way that you did mission, sitting down with strangers, with sinners, with traitors. It just brings the whole your whole incarnation as 
God in the flesh is so much more closer. That God in the flesh would then also sit down with people that had not, wanted nothing to do with him. Sit down for a meal and eat from the same bread and drink from the same bottle. Lord, I thank you that we got to experience that as well. That you came that close. That you met us or are meeting us now where we are. And that from that place, from meeting with you, we can begin to follow you. And follow you into a new life. Jesus, I pray for us as a, as a church, but really for us as, as individuals, that you will um, give us a heart of hospitality. Give us generous hearts towards neighbors and strangers, whatever they look like, whatever they think, whatever language they speak, whatever side of politics they're on. Give us a heart of hospitality and a heart of generosity towards them so that we may enact grace, but also find opportunities to talk about the grace that we've received from you. Give us a vision for this way of mission, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's worship.